God lives in me. You would not get in the car with my dad unless you were saved. You are not a loser and stop listening to hell. Crown Prince and the, everybody was going freaky over this. Give it to him, give it to him. Would you please let him be God? Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give an advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphan, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, who's not Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, but the other Judas, he said, but Lord, why, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will teach them, and you will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. At this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as world. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. Okay, so, if there's a scripture you need to study, every line has a lesson. And we're not gonna go through every line, we're not going to, you, honestly, if I was a professor in Bible college and I was teaching the Holy Spirit, which is called pneumatology, I would spend at least two to three lessons minimum on John 14, because John 14 tells you who the Holy Spirit is. Okay, the first thing is this. He starts off with this. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, this is just not the Ten Commandments. Remember, the, the rich guy comes and says, you know, uh, how do you love the Lord? And he says, well, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus looked at the rich guy and says, yeah, you answer correctly. The commandments of God are from Genesis to Revelations. And the fact is this, this no, I don't like that one or I like this one. You, you take the word of God for what it is. Now, now watch this. He goes on and he says, and I will send an advocate to help you. Now, now, when we think of an advocate, we think of a lawyer who goes before a judge, okay? The lawyer goes before a judge and arguing for you in order to get you off because you're charged with something. Well, the word here in the Greek, instead of advocate, well, the definition has advocate in it, is paraclete. The Greek word is paraclete, okay? And the Greek word really means helper. Now, not as a maid or as a servant or as a butler, someone who comes alongside to help you, but as a boss. Illustration. A couple of weeks ago, we're going down the 401, we hit snow, we can't see the road at all. My son, who's sitting in the passenger seat, is saying, you know, Dad, snowbank is 10 feet away from here. And Shelly's in the back seat, she's looking, and they're helping me, okay, get down the 401. But around a half an hour later, after I'm only doing five kilometers an hour, a tractor trailer comes by and I stay with the tractor trailer. It helps me, it takes the lead. The Holy Spirit is an advocate, is a comforter. In King James it says comforter. But really the word is helper. He is there to take the lead in helping me. In other words, 
He doesn't take directions from me, but he gives directions. He doesn't only give directions, but he's helped there to supplement and empower the directions that he gives. So, it's not my will, but it's his will. Now, before we go on, for some of you who are brand new Christians, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one. Okay? So remember, when you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have Jesus in you. You have Father God in you. And in John 14, he goes on and he talks about this. But here's the, here's the key. Remember, if you don't remember anything else, the Holy Spirit wants to be your paraclete, help you. Not only spiritually, but physically, emotionally, financially. He wants to help you in every area of your life. Some people laugh about this, but when I walk into Walmart, I always say, Jesus, give me a good deal. Right? Somebody says, well, why do you pray to Jesus, not the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit's in you. Well, the Holy Spirit's in me, but the Holy Spirit wants the glory to go to Jesus and to the Father. Is it a sin to pray to the Holy Spirit? No, not at all. But, but the Spirit of the Lord wants you to give the glory to Jesus and the Father. Now, in verse 17 of that sheet you have, it says the Holy Spirit is Jesus' Spirit of truth. Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth. Now, somebody says to me, what, what, what does that mean? Well, what he wants to do is he wants to show you the truth. And he wants to lead you into the truth. But he also wants to help you with the truth. And therefore, he will convict. Or he will discern in you. I, I love this. Somebody says, give, give me a little more teaching. Well, in verse 17, it says the world can't see him and the world doesn't know him. And this is absolute truth. See, in order to know, in order to know the Holy Spirit, you have to take a step of faith. In order to have Jesus in you, you have to take a step of faith. It's not feelings, it's faith. And the world wants facts. Oh, I want to see God. I want to hear God. But Jesus teaches us that we need to walk in faith. We, we live by faith. But see, we know the Holy Spirit, and I love this because he lives in us. Now, listen to me carefully. He doesn't just live beside me and in front of me and all around me. He lives in me. Verse 18, Christ lives in us through the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, we have God in us and we are in God. Then he goes on in verse 26, he brings up the advocate. And here's the great one, verse 26, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and will remind you of everything. And then Jesus says at the end, I give you peace. Well, what does he give? Does he just give you peace and walk away? No, he gives you the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit's there, there's peace. Now, last week, we were talking, we had two services in the morning and night. We're talking about the, the, the woman pushing through the crowd to touch the hem of the garment of Jesus, and she's healed. And it said in the scripture, if you read the scripture, Mark 5, it says, she thought in her mind, if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. So she took what was in her mind and she pushed through and we said she had faith and she had fortitude. The problem with people receiving miracles today is a lot of people have just faith, but they don't react or they don't do stuff with their faith. Fortitude is when you take your faith and you put it into action. The lady thought in her mind, mm, if I touch his hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Well, that's great. Sit there for the rest of your life, think that, until you're blue in the face. But one day, she woke up and she said, no, I'm gonna push through, and fortitude. Now, the second thing we taught last week was this, waking up with a proper mentality. When was the last time you woke up saying, you know what, he loves me. He wants to bless me. And he wants to help me. 
Well, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is. He's the paraclete, the advocate, the counselor, the restorer, the healer. It doesn't matter what you need. If it's godly, he's there to give it to you. Now listen to me carefully. He wants to love me. He wants to bless me. He wants to heal me. He wants to restore me. And the craziest thing is this, he is in me, yet most of us, we do not use the precious Holy Spirit the way we should. Let, let, let me give you, let me give you, are you ready? Application for this week. God is holy and he lives in you. Think about that. Now just stop, okay? It doesn't sound deep, does it? Well, it is. God lives in me. I was on the street a few years ago and I was talking to some people on the street. They were into prostitution, stuff like this, and male prostitutes and female prostitutes. And we're just, and they said, so what the beep beep is so different about you? And I looked at them and I said, I have God. And one guy said, where's your God? And I said, in me. And he started to mock me and one of the other prostitutes looked at him and said, hey, shut up. Let the guy speak. I said, God isn't just around me. God is in me. See, the Holy Spirit is our paraclete. He is our helper, but he lives in me. When was the last time you woke up with the mentality of that lady who pushed through the crowd? You know what? I'm going to touch him today. I'm going to touch him today because he's in me. He's in me. When was the last time you started to have a bad day and you started quoting scriptures and say, I can do all things through Christ? Why? The Holy Spirit's in me. Greater is he that's in me than he's in the world. And you just started shooting scriptures off. Jesus said, I'll never forsake you. I'll always be there for you. Boy, he's in me. I know what I'm talking about. I tell you, my dad was the worst driver in the world. I, I, I've sh I should have seen Jesus at least 100 times. I don't even know, understand how my dad did not kill us. My dad was a short, I'm six foot two. My dad was five foot eight, okay? His belly was five foot eight. <laughs> he could drive, and I'm not even joking when I say this, he could drive with his belly. And he would start talking to my mom. And he, what, have you ever driven with somebody like this where they, they're going down the road talking? <laughs> right? And it, my mom would always say, watch the road. And he'd go back, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I tell you, I know the power of God because there's so many times we were about to see Jesus and my mother would call out, in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, something happened and we got through it. And my dad said, I'm all right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I'm in the back seat. Our Father who art in heaven, our Lord be thy name. I knew that prayer backwards. I told you, you would not get in the car with my dad unless you were saved. <laughs> Can I share this with you? My mom taught me that Jesus is just not with me, he's in me. Do you understand that? He's in me. And there's been times where, and, uh, 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 where there's been people who are demonic and we've had to do an exorcism. And the demons understand that we are full of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
because the Holy Spirit is in me. This is why I love point three, the Holy Spirit is our paraclete. My dad used to say to me, he said, when we get to heaven, we'll probably be embarrassed when we realize how much God wanted to help us and we just did not step out in faith and take it. We try to make our lives comfortable without God instead of making our lives uncomfortable with the need of God. Great men and women of God in history were men and women who had faith and fortitude and just stepped out in the uncomfortable in order so the Holy Spirit could be the paraclete. When Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you, some people would say, well, he's lying. He did leave us. No, he's still in us because he is the Holy Spirit. He is Father God. They're all one. So somebody says to me, what's the application here? Get close to the Holy Spirit. Now, you do it through Bible and you do it through prayer and do it through church, all this stuff, but let, let me give you the one that is, the, the, let, let me do prayer. When was the last time you stopped asking God for something and you just spent a half an hour, an hour, just praying for the Holy Spirit to touch you and the Holy Spirit get closer to you? There's times when I will just come in to the prayer, prayer and I will pray, Holy Spirit, I just need you to get closer to me. I know you're in me, but I feel you're so far away from me. I, need, I know you're clo- in me, but I need to feel your presence. I need to feel the spirit of truth. I need to feel your love. I need to feel your blessing. I need to sense Holy Spirit, touch me. See, if you look at the life of Jesus, he constantly went away and prayed. Why? To get gassed up with the Holy Spirit. Why did Daniel pray three times a day? To get gassed up with the Holy Spirit. So many of us, we, we, we just, we give God our list of needs instead of looking at the whole key, the whole key to prayer is this, get close to God. I mean, when was the last time you just turned off the radio or you turned off the CD or whatever you listened to and you just started to get close to God? I want you to come. I know you're in me, but I want to give you more of me. I, want, I, will, I don't want you to come and assist me. I want you to take the lead. So somebody says to me, this is the year of miracles at church on the Queen's Road. Yes. But here's the craziest thing. How many of you woke up this morning needing a miracle instead of recognizing you had a miracle? Are you ready? This morning, I woke up. I have a miracle. God's in me. Think about that. I mean, how cool is that? God's in me. He's just not beside me. He's in me. That's a miracle. You know, if you, you, you shot me right now and I died, guess what? I go to heaven. Hello. That's pretty cool. Yes, I, I need God to perform a healing. I have a, a foot that's, my left foot's not that great, but I, and God, I believe in God for healing. But here's the craziest thing, the miracles I already have. See, a lot of us are seeking miracles instead of praising him for the miracles we already have. Let, let me give you an example. When was the last time you praised him? You were in a country called Canada that had freedom of religion. There's over 165,000 persecuted Christians in prison today. I mean, look at where you are. See, here's the craziest thing. A lot of us, we seek God for miracles instead of first praising them. I have the Holy Spirit. I'm not worthy, but through his grace and his mercy, he gave me the Holy Spirit. 
And the Holy Spirit's not beside me only, but the Holy Spirit's also in me. And when you start to understand this and you start to believe this, all of a sudden you will start to wake up like the lady who pushed her way through the crowd and say, I can touch the hem of the garment and be healed. Why? Because he loves me. He wants to bless me. And he wants to help me. Okay. I write this sermon a long time ago, okay? I don't have an illustration at the end. And all of a sudden, it's this week, and I'm going, Lord, I don't have an illustration. I'm tapped. And I say, help. My brother says to me, hey, let's go to such and such a church on Wednesday night. There's going to be this guy speaking. I would like to hear him. So I go with my brother to such and such church, which I will not mention. And before this guy stands up to speak about the book of Daniel, they said, we have a missionary here tonight from the, the, uh, from the Far East. We're not going to mention the country he's in, but we'd like him to come give a five-minute report. So this guy gets up and he says, I'm a missionary in such and such a country, and it's a country that does not accept missionaries, but I'm there and I'm, we're winning people to Christ and da-da-da. He says, but let me tell you the rest of the story. He says, God tells me two years ago to go to a country in the Far East that is so anti-Christian that if you share the gospel or you are caught with the Bible, you are instantly, automatically executed. No trial. If you are found out to be a Christian, you are executed immediately. So I go to this country for, on a visa as a visitor for two weeks and I'm walking around the streets and I don't see any Christianity, I don't meet a Christian, and I'm walking, I'm talking to Father God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and I'm saying, okay, why did you send me here? Like, there's gotta be purpose. And all of a sudden, I hear the Holy Spirit in me say, you're here to win this country to Jesus. And the missionary says, this is impossible. The whole country is so hostile to Christians that I'll be executed. Trust me, I am God. I will open the door. And all of a sudden he gets in the back of a taxi cab and the taxi driver knows English and he's driving him around the city and all of a sudden he sees everywhere he goes basketball nets and kids playing basketball outside. So he says to the taxi driver, hey, stop for a sec. Tell me, these kids all play basketball. He says, the king and the crown prince of such and such country loves American basketball. And the king has bought thousands and thousands of nets and thousands and thousands of ball. He wants basketball nets everywhere so kids can play American basketball. All of a sudden, the missionary gets back to his hotel and the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, write the king, tell him you play basketball. So he writes the king of this country a letter, hi, I have a basketball team from the United States that would love to come over to your country to teach your teenagers how to play basketball. Would you like us to come? All of a sudden, he gets a letter six weeks later from the crown prince. Not only are you invited to our country, but we will pay your flights, we will take care of your hotel, you will be in the royal palace area with us, you will be our special, but you need to know there's only one gymnasium in our country. It is run for the royal family and it's going to be yours to run your basketball program. Well, he writes them back, says, no, we cannot come unless you let us do it our way, the American way. 
we pray to Jesus before every game and we share devotion. And the crown prince runs back, well, we want American basketball. Whatever American basketball is, bring it. Are you ready? I'm sitting there on Wednesday night going, ho, ho, ho. We're using this one on Sunday, like this. And then the missionary goes, but that's not the good news. He said, we went over and we started doing these basketball camps. He says, I would take Christian basketball players from different universities all over the United States. They would give me two weeks. And we would go over there. He said, we were treated like royalty. He said, you wouldn't believe how good it was. And he said, before every uh, lesson, we would tell them about Jesus and then we would pray. And then later on, the basketball players would sit down with the kids and just share about Christ. He says, it was amazing how many kids knew English. But he said, then I got back to my country that I'm a missionary in and I get a letter from the king. We want you to bring a team back but this time you're gonna take and you're gonna play the best people in our country, basketball. But one other requirement, you as coach, you have to play also. He's 55 years of age. When you're 55 years of age, you're over the hill. Okay, I just thought I'd share that with you. Okay, how many of you are over the hill? Just raise your hands. Well, just so you know, it's easier to go down the hill than go up the hill. So I love being over the hill. Are you ready? He writes back to the king, do you understand we're gonna bring American basketball with Jesus in it? And the king's representative writes back, says, yeah, we understand what you do, bring it. So that he shows up with all these university players and all of a sudden, the royal family shows up for the game. And he meets the king, he meets the crown prince, he meets all these people, and they all said, are you gonna play? And he says, yes, you asked me to play, I will play. And, and then they said, we pray that your God will help you. <laughs> So he walks into the dressing room and his hands are up, Holy Spirit, I need you. I'm 55. Well, the game starts and the guys who are on the other team that represent the king are pretty good players. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes on this 55-year-old missionary and he tells it this way on Wednesday night. He says, no matter what I did, when I shot the ball, it would go in. <laughs> he, said, he said, the players on my team started to see the anointing of the Holy Spirit on me so good that they kept feeding me the ball. And he said, and he said, he said halfway through the game, the king and the crown prince and everybody standing on their feet yelling, give it to him, give it to him, give it to him. <laughs> and he said, he said, I have never, ever played basketball like this in my, he said, when I was in university on scholarship, he said, I would have given my right hand for this. He said, he, and he, and he jumping up and down on Wednesday night, he said, you wouldn't believe it. He said, I even closed my eyes a few times and just threw it and it went in. He said, I got so many three pointers. And he said, the crown prince and the, everybody was going freaky over this. Give it to him, give it to him. And, at 55, he says, I was making the younger guy, and the younger guys knew I was looking hot. And, and he said, my wife wasn't there to see it. He said, at the end, the king came up and hugged me. And the king said, you and your team will come three times a year with your basketball team and your God. We want you. Hello! You have the Holy Spirit 
in you. Would you please let him be God? He wants to love you. He wants to help you. And he wants to bless you. And he is crying for you to have faith and fortitude. You are not a loser and stop listening to hell. God doesn't live in a loser. He wants to be your advocate. He wants to be your comforter. He wants to be your restorer. He wants to be the one who not only guides, but he wants to be the boss. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, he is not only gonna be with you, but he's gonna be with you forever. Church, you have God. Let God be God.